We're exploring a new theme on the podcast called The Anointed. Anointing is taking oil and smearing it on someone, and it has a very specific purpose. Oil marks a person or place that's a bridge between heaven and earth. Cool, but why oil? Why not wine? What's going on? So what we're going to trace down in this conversation is there's a recipe for special anointing oil. You can find it in the Torah. The recipe for anointing oil is given by God to Moses on Mount Sinai. And it's not just oil, it's oil infused with pungent, aromatic spices, and it makes this incredible perfume. How creation's packed with these plants that if you just ate the leaf, you would not enjoy it, but you crush it, pulverize it, or soak it, and then it can infuse this with a taste that just is like otherworldly. What I think the biblical authors want us to see in this anointing oil is the life of Eden condensed into a little dense liquid. The life of Eden begins with the water of life filling the dry ground and forming the human, and then God's spirit fills the human. Water and spirit, marking humanity as a place where heaven and earth are one. And so to remember that place, or even to designate a place to be like that, we anoint it with oil. There's moments when through liquid and spirit, A person, a place, is marked as a special portal between heaven and earth to bring about that reunion of heaven and earth in some way. And I think that's where all of a sudden all these themes come crashing together (laughs) of the liquid life and the spirit are joined images. And that's what anointing means in the Bible. Today, Tim Mackey and I continue exploring the theme of the anointed, looking at the symbol of oil in the Bible. I'm John Collins, and you're listening to Bible Project Podcast. Thanks for joining us. Here we go. Hey, Tim. Hey, John. Hello. Hi. Hey, we're just kind of right at the beginning of a new conversation Mm -hmm. on the theme of anointing. Anointing. Smearing someone with oil. (laughs) Yes. 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 Yeah, so we kind of really set the stage. Last episode, Mm -hmm. you talked about how this was something that the early church was doing. Mm -hmm. James actually Mm -hmm. said to, in the letter that he wrote to early Christians, um, to do it when you're praying for healing for someone, smear oil on them. And just kind of begs the question, like, where'd this come from? And Mm -hmm. actually where that brought us to was a a ritual we find in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, of anointing people with oil. And we very specifically saw that it was not just anyone. Mm-hmm. It wasn't people who needed prayer, yeah. actually. Yeah. I suppose you could pray <laughs> for these people. But it was specifically to select one human and say, you now represent all of mm. Israel in the case of the Old Testament yeah. in a very special way. You're representing God to the people and the people to God. You are a bridge now mm-hmm. or a gate between heaven and earth. Mm-hmm. So while you are amongst the people, you need to now be connected to God in a special way so heaven and earth can be united mm-hmm. through you. And so this was done with the priests. Mm-hmm. Aaron was the first one anointed. This was done to kings. Mm-hmm. And one time it was done to a prophet. Well, <laughs> it was, was said to be done. Supposed to have been done. <laughs> we don't know. For a prophet. Whatever yeah, that's was right. done. That's right. It also, a few times, objects are anointed. We didn't talk about it, but I think I remember that mm-hmm. tabernacle objects. Yeah, we'll talk about it in just a moment. Okay. Yeah. But the one we did talk about was the story of Jacob mm-hmm. when he was asleep out in the middle of nowhere and he was on the run from his brother who he had deceived (laughs) and uh, he's out in the wilderness and he fell asleep and a gateway to heaven appears, a ramp to heaven. God's on the ramp, the angels are on the ramp. And he's like, this is Mm. the house of God. Yeah. The gate of the skies. He found the gate. Yeah. The gate. The gate found him. Stargate. As you said. Yeah. Stargate. (laughs) Wasn't that a sci-fi movie? Yeah. Yeah. And so Mm -hmm. the big aha is to anoint someone or something Mm -hmm. is to signify it as Mm. a connection point between heaven and earth, whether a person or a place. Yep. And all of this is the background that is condensed and summarized in a title, the anointed one, that is the main title applied to Jesus throughout the New Testament, Jesus Christ. When we say Jesus Christ, that's Jesus Christos, Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. The anointed one. Yep. Christos means the person smeared with oil. The person smeared with oil, which now we at least know on one level, the basic level of meaning, 
for a Jewish man, an audience, to say that about someone is that this is a person who is marked out to be a link, a bridge between heaven and earth. That's what it means to call somebody the Christos. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, it beg the question for me, we started the conversation saying that the early church was doing this for anyone who was sick. Mm-hmm. And you told a story of, you know, when you were a kid, this was done to you when you were really sick. Mm-hmm. And that's different. Applying oil to someone and praying for healing is different than appointing oil on someone to establish them as the representative bridge between the divine yeah. and the land. Yeah. And you said, well, there's something going on mm. with the people of Jesus being called the anointed ones. Yeah, Christians. Christians. <laughs> no longer is it just one person, but like mm-hmm. through Jesus now, this anointing is going out. Mm-hmm. So. I think we'll get there, Yeah. but you said even before that, we need to appreciate deeper what it is that the oil represents. Represents. Yeah. Because so far we're just kind of taking for granted, okay, we're using oil. Yeah, that's right. Oil marks a person or place that's a bridge between heaven and earth. Cool. But why oil? Why not? Why oil? Water. Why not wine? Why not? Yeah. Wine would stain. (laughs) 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 You're wearing a nice... Linen yeah. that day. You, yeah, yeah. You might, yeah. It doesn't smear as well, <laughs> you know, it runs too much. Yeah, so something's going yeah. on with the oil. Yeah, why oil? What's going on? So, yeah, what we're going to trace down in this conversation is there's a recipe for special anointing oil. You can find it in the Torah, second scroll of the Torah. See a business opportunity here. <laughs> <In the exodus>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's, well, well let's... <laughs> Leave that for the moment. And what we're going to see is that recipe and why and how and when it gets used all points back to the Garden of Eden. So lo and behold, we're going to spend most of this conversation meditating on the Garden of Eden story in Genesis chapter 2, which, you know, all the main themes begin in the first chapters of the Bible. Yeah. So it's inevitable that we'll be pulled back there. It's like a gravity well. It <laughs> keeps pulling us back in the early chapters of Genesis. I suppose I'm the one who allows it. I let myself get pulled in. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's I a have, great. It's, a, it's great. I force you to go with me. It's awesome. <laughs> okay. So first to an ancient recipe for making anointing oil. So in Exodus chapter 30, which is right near the end of when Moses has been up on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, up in the storm cloud, and he's been seeing God's heavenly temple and being shown all of these things. And then he is being given a blueprint for how he is to create a copy or an image of those things that's called the pattern. And that will be the tabernacle. So you get this image that the tabernacle and all all the curtains and the segmented boundary areas and what they all mean and the imagery, that it's all a pattern or an image of some heavenly reality. Then what he's told is that after you make the tabernacle and... All the furniture, all the pieces. All the stuff. Yeah. Here's what you are to do. You shall make a holy anointing oil. So holy, meaning set apart for a space that's dedicated to the presence of God. Okay. So it's an oil that marks a heaven on earth spot mm. that is sacred and set apart from any other space. Yeah. It's to be a perfume mixture. The work of a perfumer, it shall be holy anointing oil. Mm. Okay, we'll look at the recipe in a moment, but here's what gets anointed. What gets anointed is the tent of meeting. Ooh, the word meeting. Divine and human. Mm. Meeting. Mm-hmm. Oh. It's the bridge place of heaven and earth. Yeah, because the tabernacle is often called the tent of meeting. Mm-hmm. Or always called. Ah, uh, no, sometimes it's called 
the dwelling place, okay. referring to the place that hosts God's glory. Mm-hmm. But when it's called the tent of meeting, it's referring mm-hmm. to the union union of divine and human cool. in meeting in the tent. So anoint the actual just big tent, mm-hmm. the big tent. The, the structure itself. Yep. Then the golden box called the ark of the testimony. Then the table, that is the table for the bread, the sacred bread. That's in the holy place. It's in the holy place. And all the utensils get wiped down. What, what are the utensils used for? Oh, well, there's poles that are put in, there's little rings on that table, and then there's poles put into them, maybe plates and stuff like that mm, okay. goes on the table. The menorah, the seven lampstand, and all of its utensils, which is little snuffers mm-hmm. and lamp lighters and so on. Anoint the altar of incense, anoint the altar of burnt offering, and then all of its utensils, like the knives and the forks. And this is what's out in the courtyard. Out in the courtyard. Also the basin for water in its stand. Mark them as holy. They will become most holy. Whoever touches them will become holy. Then anoint Aaron and his sons. Mark them as holy so they can serve me. So the whole, yeah, pretty comprehensive. Yeah. Every part of this space it's is being anointed. A, yep, marked as a heaven on earth space. So when an Israelite goes through the door, the gateway into the courtyard, you are in heaven on <laughs> earth. <laughs> mm, okay. That's, that's the idea. Was this done just in its inauguration? Mm-hmm. Or was this done every time they set it up? It, at its inauguration. Okay. That's the whole idea. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. So what is this oil? Exodus 30, verse 22. Yeah. Let's get a perfumer involved. Yeah. Yeah. Take for yourself, this is what God says to Moses, take for yourself the finest of spices, flowing myrrh. 500 shekels, fragrant cinnamon, half as a much. A shekel is a, um, an amount? A unit of weight. Mm-hmm. It's a unit of weight. Okay. Yeah. This myrrh needs to flow? Yeah. Myrrh, this was dictionary work I had to do. Oh. Myrrh. It's a resin. Is a Southern Arabian gum resin. Oh. With a strong aromatic smell. It flows out of trees unique to South Arabia. Oh. So it's a gummy. Yeah. It's tree sap. Tree sap. You know, maybe, well, here in Pacific Northwest, like we've got pines. And we've stuff. got pines, yeah. and this is what makes. There's a very distinct pine tree sap smell. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Have you ever tried to taste it? Oh boy, maybe as a kid, yeah. Is it? I think maybe I was with bitter? my kids, and they wanted because it smells amazing yeah, yeah, when yeah. you're hiking in the summer, right? Like in the Cascade Mountains, you know where we live, and a warm afternoon up in the evergreen forest, mm. and it's just. It's just the warm smell of pine, mm. and you walk by a tree, and it just smells amazing, and it has slap. It smells extra amazing. Mm-hmm. And so, I don't know, this was some years ago, because the logic for my boys was, if it smells amazing, mm-hmm. like in our kitchen, mm-hmm. then it probably is going to taste amazing. Yeah. It's horrible. <laughs> it's the most bitter, mm. so bitter, mm-hmm. yeah. but it smells so sweet. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Totally. Anyway. anyway. Honey doesn't, I mean, honey has a smell. Oh, it's like the opposite. But it doesn't smell nearly as strong as it tastes. Yeah. And sap's like the opposite. <laughs> it's also interesting that the default smell that we want for mm. our cars, right? <laughs> <laughs> like when we add an air freshener, like the main scent is pine. Pine, yeah. Yeah, what's up In the that? shape of a tree. Yeah. You hang from your... Yeah. When did that start and yeah. why? It's like, you know what I need in this car? Mm-hmm. I need the smell of the forest. Smell of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... All right. This holy anointing oil had a Southern Arabian tree smell to it. That's myrrh. I want to smell that now. <laughs> like right now. We should have a little sample of all these. Yeah, we should. We should. So... You have a base amount of myrrh. Okay. I'm just going to imagine pine. Just, I could go with pine. <laughs> <laughs> then you get half as much of cinnamon. It's a cinnamon mm. smells so amazing. Cinnamon is amazing. And a Wikipedia search taught me that the cinnamon tree is indigenous to modern Sri Lanka. Didn't know that. And spread all throughout the ancient world, okay. obviously. Uh, it's a tree? Is it from the bark of the tree? Where do you get the cinnamon? That's my favorite, just cinnamon and sugar and butter, like on bread. 
It doesn't really get much better than that, no, it's honestly. True. It's true. Yeah, bark. The inner bark of the tree. Oh, yeah. Bark strips. Yeah. yeah have you seen those? Yeah. Okay, the cinnamon stick. When you see a cinnamon stick, yeah, and it's curled, it's a bark strip. It's taking that inner layer of the bark, but then it f- kind of folds up because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cause trees are round. Yeah. <laughs> it used to be known, oh, yeah, as Ceylon cinnamon, because the island of Sri Lanka was formerly known as Ceylon, I think, in the British colonial period. I think period. spices are just marvelous in general. Uh, if you it's think a, about it. It's incredible. Well, okay. All right. Actually, so let us marvel more. Yeah. Because this is a part of the meaning of the oil. Yeah. Yeah. Why are they so amazing? Well, I mean, just think about how bland food would be. How bland food is <laughs> yeah. without spices. Yeah. And all a and spice seasonings. Yeah. is like you find some sort of plant. Yes. And you wouldn't eat this plant normally. Mm-hmm. Like it wouldn't make a meal. Yeah. But you take the flavor of that and then you spread that into a dish in combination with other flavors. And all of a sudden, yeah. you have what was a meal is now a cuisine, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And how rare and special it was. I mean, there was whole trades, global trade yes. economies yeah. set up on like, we need some of that spice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, let's get some of that over no, here. No, the spice route from Southeast Asia through India, all the way over to North Africa. Yeah. This was a money route. <laughs> huge, huge it's amounts of wealth. transforming our food experience. Yeah. And this is all long before... I mean, the wheel had been invented, but uh, <laughs> it was long before planes, trains, and automobiles. Yeah. Yeah. No, really, really big deal. I've been really into paprika lately. Been exploring paprika. Mm-hmm. It's, it's sensitive. Mm-hmm. You can overdo it. Yeah. And if it's not done right, it can go wrong. But the right amount of paprika in a certain savory kind of dish, mm. it can really. Do you cook? Well, I'm more of the sous chef. Okay. At, at our house. But there's certain things. On Friday nights, mm-hmm. we do like a Shabbat celebration. It's taco night. Mm-hmm. And I usually make the guacamole. Nice. So I've been exploring all different yeah. kinds of ways I'm, to make guacamole. I'm, I'm the guacamole guy at home too. Are you? T- really? And that's really simple. I mean, really, it's it's garlic mm-hmm. and onions and lime. Onions? Oh, yeah. You yeah. chop up onions really fine. You do garlic. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to do too much garlic, but it's possible. I've, yeah. I've done yeah, it. Yeah, me I've too. Done it. Yeah. And yeah. it's not like this isn't enjoyable. It's kind of more like yeah. we smell horrible now. Yeah, that's it's, yeah, totally right. <laughs> yeah. No, the lime's super important. Salt, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, but a little paprika. Okay. I'll, let mm. me try the yeah. paprika. Yeah. Or sometimes oregano. Uh-huh. Okay. But that's a good example of oregano. It's just like crushed leaves. Yeah. Of some tree, the oregano tree. I have no idea. It's a, I think it's a plant. So what what we're meditating Marveling on, on. <laughs> is about how creation's packed with these plants that if you just ate the leaf, you would not enjoy it. Right. But you crush it or pulverize it or soak it, mm. and then it can infuse this with a taste that just is like otherworldly. <laughs> it just transforms. Yeah. Okay. So that experience... Mm-hmm. Of taking what is mundane uh, and filling it with some transformative power through yeah. this dust or <laughs> smell or yeah, yeah, yeah. St- from plants, yeah, cultivated plants from plants. Plant. Well, I mean wild or, plants, but or cinnamon. It's a tree, but yeah, yeah, trees okay. and plants. Okay, so we're not done yet. Um, there's also some. Oh yeah, we only got to we only got to two. So yeah. <laughs> two ingredients. <laughs> got some myrrh. We got some. We got some tree sap. A little bit of cinnamon. Here we go. Yeah, okay. Fragrant cane. Okay. So, oh yeah. So Hebrew lexicographers, which is what you call people who study the meaning of ancient words and ancient languages, are not sure what exact plant is being referred to here. It's only, the word is only used here and in Jeremiah chapter six, but some sort of cane or reed plant that has a really strong smell. Okay. Have you ever had sweet cane before? You're talking about sugar? Sugar cane. Yeah. Yeah. That's like full of the sugar water inside. Yeah. You just take a bite out of it. Oh, you just eat the whole thing? I've never... Well, liked... you take a bite, you peel off the Oh, you chew it and then spit it out? You peel off and just, you take a bite and it's just soaked goodness, but yeah. it's pulp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you spit out the pulp, but... Uh, I haven't done it. No. It's a pretty remarkable experience. But my hunch is, this is some kind of smelly 
Because the whole thing is about the smell right. of this oil. Okay. Okay. Then after that is... We're going to have a hard time making this if we don't even know what it is. <laughs> That's true. The last one is cassia, 500 shekels of that. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. Cassia, a Hebrew word, kida, some sort of aromatic bark from an East Asian evergreen tree. Hmm. You mix these four things together. You would have either boiled or dried them, mm -hmm. crushed them into a powder. And then the last thing is you mix it with a bunch of olive oil. Hmm. So this myrrh, cinnamon, fragrant cane, cassia. One part myrrh. Mm -hmm. Half a part cinnamon. Yep. Half part cane. Half part cane, yep. one part cassia. Yep. Mix it with some olive oil. And you've got some you've holy got, anointing oil. You've got the holy anointing oil. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you could go find these things in the wild, but odds are, you know, if you're going to get them through the spice trade, that they're being cultivated. Yeah. But, you know, by this point. So you have these cultivated plants mm -hmm. that smell and taste amazing. Mm -hmm. And then you mix it with the oil. Now, what's oil? So oil, like olive oil, mm -hmm. is... That was so funny. I was just looking at pictures that Jessica and I took when we went to go harvest olives on the Mount of Olives when we lived oh, in you did Jerusalem. That. Yeah, it was a cool... Yeah, we had some friends who lived on the west side of the Mount of Olives and they lived next to an olive field and got to know the people who owned it. And so when they harvested... They said, invite some of your friends to come. It was a remarkable experience. Mm -hmm. We spent all afternoon on just four trees. Yeah. Thousands of olives. Wow. So you get this olive, and then you put them in burlap bags, and then you take them. And the next thing is they go get crushed. Because mm. you can eat olive. Ooh, and they're actually really bad. They're terribly bitter if you eat them off the tree. Right off the tree. Yeah. Yeah, they got to be. And they're probably them. pretty, like, tough. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So you have to be soaked and brined and okay. pickled and all that. And that's the olives we typically eat have been soaked in various ways. Mm -hmm. But if you take them in their fresh state and crush them with stones, what will ooze out is this oil. Mm. And there's different ways to make it, right? Virgin, extra virgin. I'd actually, I'm, I don't know what this means technically. I think it has to do with the age of the olives. Okay. But olive oil is this compressed form of the life juice <laughs> yeah of this fruit of this tree yeah what are what are you technically getting you're getting because there's water in there mm -hmm. and then you're just like the water is soaked with fat Ooh, here here thank you wikipedia it's a liquid fat obtained from olives produced by pressing whole olives and extracting the oil there you go the liquid Liquid fat. The composition of olive oil varies with lots of different things. Mainly, it, oh, consists of oleic acid. Oleic which acid. Which may be why it's Click on that so link. bitter. That? And other fatty acids, linoleic acid and palmitic acid. Oleic acid? Wait, oh, you just hover it. It's fine. It's a fatty acid that occurs naturally in various animals and plants. Vegetable fats and oils, colorless, odorless. When I think of acid, I think of like something that's, um, I am not a chemist, obviously. I don't mm. even know what acid really is. It's a monounsaturated omega-9 fatty acid. Great. Do you, uh, <laughs> can you oil like any plant? Well, if you like crush any mm. plant, are you going to get some sort of oil? Well, you'll get some kind of liquid. You'll get some sort of liquid. Yeah. Right. So then it's just, I guess, about the composition of it, whether it's the sticky yeah. smooth or more of the... What's the substance of the oil? How useful it is? Because, yeah, yeah I mean, we're in the oil renaissance of sorts. We've got yeah. avocado oil. Yeah. We've got... Sunflower seed oil. Sunflower seed oil. That stuff's awesome. Yeah. But probably the richer, fattier the mm. the plant mm -hmm. is than the, yeah, the yep. richer the oil. Yeah. Okay. But So that's thinking in terms of maybe our categories. So try and imagine an ancient imagination. You've got these plants that you cultivate in orchards yeah. that smell and taste like heaven. <laughs> oh, you're talking about the um, fragrances. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. you're just like, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like myrrh, cassia. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. Okay. And then olive oil is this compressed, mm. dense liquid. That the when, life of the olive. Yeah, it comes from the very fruit of the olive. And 
When you add it to dishes, I mean, it, olive oil was th- one of the main staples of cooking and life、yeah. in the Mediterranean. Just dip、region. some bread in oil. And... Yeah, you can di- yep, dip it. You can use it as skin lotion. Multi purpose. Multi purpose. And then use for all kinds of cooking. Use it for your oil lamps. Okay, right. Yeah. So olive oil was just like a staple、mm. of daily life in. You know, on the East Mediterranean where the Israelites were. So, and all of it comes from the life of this, the fruit of this tree. Yeah. So, there's something about the connection of gardens, cultivated gardens, producing these smells and tastes and substances that bring life and richness and lusciousness and taste and smell.、Mm-hmm. So, these are all of the feelings associated with. Gardens Garden life. and orchards. And so, isn't it interesting that this is the substance that's used to get smeared all over the tabernacle? And what is the tabernacle? The tabernacle is a sacred space that's set apart as a portal between heaven and earth, divine and human. And it's decorated, right? The tent and the fabrics are all decorated with palm trees and pomegranates <laughs> and cherubim. Yeah. Heaven and earth creatures.、Mm. So, the heavenly garden that is the tabernacle is smeared with this compressed liquid symbol of life. It's、mm. like this, it's liquid life. Yeah, plant life. <laughs> plant life, yeah, but condensed into this thick, rich, smelly liquid、mm. that I think becomes an image of the life of Eden. In other words, what I think. The biblical authors want us to see in this anointing oil is the life of Eden condensed into a little dense liquid, which will lead a person to ask, Well, what's going on in the Garden of Eden? What does the Garden of Eden mean? That this liquid would become a symbol of that.、Mm. Those are kind of the, the steps, at least, that my、mm-hmm. journey of trying to understand this has taken me. So that leads me to ask, What if we were to go meditate on the Garden of Eden for a moment and ask ourselves, do the themes of liquid and life appear together anywhere in the Garden of Eden story? And lo and behold, the opening sentences give us a profound meditation on just that very thing. Turning our attention to、um, the second narrative unit in the story of Genesis. So you have the seven day creation story、yeah. that goes from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 3. Maybe just quick honorary mention is that the opening sentences of the seven day creation story combine, it begins with the land being dark and wild and waste. And darkness over the face of the deep waters.、Mm-hmm. But there, hovering over the face of the waters, is the Spirit of God. And then what happens is the Spirit of God, connected with the Word of God that God speaks ten times over the course of the seven days, God calls into existence a sprouting, flourishing garden on the dry land with fruit plants and vegetation up out of the waters. So the seven day creation narrative. Has God calling a garden into existence out of the waters by means of his word and spirit? Not explicitly a garden, but, but you're saying that God creates the dry land, comes out of the waters, but then、mm-hmm. the dry land sprouts with essentially a garden. Yeah. Trees and plants. And- totally. Yeah. The description of what's growing on day three is pretty great stuff vegetation, plants with seed, fruit trees. With fruit after their kind, full of seeds. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I guess if we think garden in terms of cultivated by a person, right. But this is sort of like imagining all of the flourishing life and fruit trees 
that reproduce through fruit and seed mm -hmm. as being God's garden, as yeah. it were. Well, this feels like, yeah, like an uncultivated garden where when we get into Genesis chapter 2, yeah. verse 4 and on, yep. um, we get a, it feels more cultivated. It does. It does. So let's look at that story. Okay. I just wanted to call out okay. the, the images of out of the waters. Yeah, out of the waters. The dry land bursting with plant life by means of God's spirit. Okay. Are all connected. So the Genesis 2 verse 4, a new narrative unit begins that complements the seven-day creation narrative, but it begins in a different way. So it says, Genesis 2 verse 4, these are the... Genealogies. <laughs> <laughs> this is my translation. These are the birthings of the skies and the land when they were created in the day of Yahweh Elohim making the land and the skies. And they're going to get a whole description of the pre created land, as mm -hmm. it were. And no shrub of the field was yet in the land. No plant of the field had yet sprouted, for Yahweh Elohim had not sent rain upon the land. So it's the opposite of how the seven-day narrative begins, which is of too much water mm -hmm. and dark. Here, Here we have a dry land, no plants. No plants, no water. And there was no human to work the ground. But a stream would go up out from the land and it would water the face of the ground. So in the, you begin with kind of like a problem sequence. Mm -hmm. There's no plants, there's no water, there's no humans. Mm -hmm. And then what God is gonna do is just tick off each of those boxes, beginning with the no water problem. Mm -hmm. So a stream pops up out of the land and water is the face of the ground. So now we've solved the water problem. Now we got a bunch of mud. Yeah, yeah. So God provides water in the wilderness, mm. Mm -hmm. which is a primary first step in God creating. It's foundational yeah. to life. Yeah. Like none of the life that's going to happen will come without this water. That's right. Yeah. Water of life. The water of life. And the water is instrumental in both the creation of the humans and in the sprouting of plants, as we'll see. But first humans, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. So now you've got saturated dirt, that is mud. And so Yahweh can form the human of dust from the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the human became a living being. So notice you have the similar elements here of water. Mm -hmm. Here, not dark chaos waters, but rather water that's been channeled pop up out of the ground mm -hmm. and life water life water yeah but the water by itself can't bring about the kind of life that god purposes for the world mm. you need another ingredient and that is yahweh's spirit so here with the word breath yahweh breathing the breath of life mm -hmm. so you get this combination of water and spirit then you get living being mm. So that's a little meditation there. You have liquid life in the form of water. Mm -hmm. Then you have spirit life in the form <laughs> of, breath. of breath. And then you get the human becomes a living being. Okay. So the human is the land hmm. yeah. soaked with water, yeah. given God's breath. Yeah, that's right. So humans are a combination of heaven and earth, mm. as it were. Yeah. They're of the dust of the ground. Mm -hmm. Formed from the dust of the ground, mm -hmm. but breathed into them is God's breath. God's breath, heavenly breath. Yeah. So. But mm -hmm. there's also the ingredient of water. Yeah. Because yeah. to form the ground, mm -hmm. you needed yeah. watery to, yeah, dirt. The, the dust to become mud so that it can be formed. That word form is the word used to describe of working with clay to mold it. Okay. You can't mold dust, but you can mold mud or mm -hmm. clay. Mm -hmm. So for humans, so now we've addressed the human problem. Okay. Verse eight, Yahweh Elohim planted a garden in Eden toward the east, and he placed there the human he had formed. And Yahweh Elohim caused to sprout from the ground, and then a list of things here, every tree, that's desirable to see and good for eating, 
and the tree of life, also in the middle of the garden, and the tree of knowing good and bad. So now we've solved the plant problem. And tree doesn't just refer to trees, right? This is eight. Oh, yeah, that's right. It can refer to whole variety. Vines and shrubs and mm -hmm. anything wooden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with a wooden stock. Yeah. Yeah. So the problem was no plants, no human, no water. And God solved the problem in the order of provide water, solve the human, and solve the plant problem. Okay. But notice how the order goes. He forms the human, mm -hmm. he plants a garden, then he puts the human in the garden, and then we're told what is sprouting in the garden, namely every tree that's desirable. Mm -hmm. So there's this combination of the water is like the precondition. Mm -hmm. It's what makes possible both the making of the human and the sprouting of the garden. Hmm. It's the base. Yeah. So the water of life is foundationally necessary for this sprouting of life here on the land. And that, if you have water, you can get plants. But if you have just the water, you don't get image of God human. You mm. need some other element, a water heavenly element. Water and breath. Water and spirit. Yes. Yeah. And well, okay. Here it's called breath, but you're saying that's connected to God's spirit. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, it's interesting. So like, I'm not like a chemist, <laughs> but like, I think there's language around, you've got some sort of base liquid, but there's then when you add some sort of active ingredient mm. and then something new happens. Hmm. But in, in this situation, what you need as a base is water yeah. Yeah. and land together. And then the active ingredient to make a living being. Oh, yeah. It's breath. It's breath. Yeah. So I think the thing to note here in the way this is designed is that what water does for the land mm -hmm. to bring about plants mm. is set on analogy for what the spirit does with the watered ground to bring about the human. Hmm. And even the three lines... Verses seven through nine. Here, this is about the Hebrew literary design of these verses. But there's three little units here, each of them beginning with three things that Yahweh Elohim does. And the opening word of each of these three statements all sound the same in Hebrew. So Yahweh Elohim formed the human. The first word is vayitzer, to mm. form. Yahweh Elohim planted a garden. Vayita <laughs> is planted. Yahweh Elohim caused to sprout from the ground. Vayitzmach. So, Vayitzer, Vayitta, Vayitzmach. Hmm. And then there's other things in here that repeated words that kind of match it together. So, the human life that emerges from the ground is set on analogy to the plants that come up out of the ground. And the humans are the result of water and spirit. The plants are the result of water. So, the way that water works and brings life is set on analogy to the way that water and spirit bring life. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, we've talked about before how in the biblical imagination, ancient imagination, animals and humans, we're just talking about humans here, mm -hmm. but oh, animals yeah. and humans yes, yes. are fundamentally different than plants yeah. in terms of their types of life. That's right. The word living creature, living being is not applied to plants. Plants. Yeah. Plants have, they are alive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they have seed, which makes them like mm -hmm. part of this like mm -hmm. generative multiplying life yeah. that God creates. Yeah. And they need water. Mm -hmm. But then there's this category of living creatures. Yeah. Animate. Yeah. Animate creatures. Yeah. And we're here, we're just talking about humans, but yeah. it's also the case that all animals have the breath of God, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's exactly We right. are all animated, humans and any creature, yeah. through the life-giving ruach energy that's right. of God. Yeah. And a great place to go is go meditate on Psalm 104 and take a long walk. And, <laughs> and think about the role of God's spirit in that poem and the spirit that's blowing around in creation, blowing the trees, is the spirit that animates humans, is the spirit that animates animals. Mm. And it's God's spirit.
So there's also a theme of talking about people like trees. Yes, that's right. Yeah. We've got a, a great lengths talking about that. Mm-hmm. So just kind of enter this mindset is to go like, as as a whatever I am, <laughs> <laughs> this thing that I am, I'm like a tree. Mm-hmm. I, I come from the land mm-hmm. and I'm watered. Yeah. And I could be like a healthy tree planted by a stream or I could be kind yeah. of a withered tree. And so in some way I'm kind of like a tree, but I'm not merely a tree. Mm. But trees just have the water of life from the land. Yeah, yeah. I'm something even more. Yeah. There's another ingredient that has caused me to be a living being, a creature, mm-hmm. which is God's spirit. And so when I think about life, what it means to be alive. Mm. I think about the water of life that makes me kind of like the trees, but then I think of also then the spirit of God, yeah. which makes me into a living nefesh. Yeah, nefesh, a living creature. Living creature. Yeah. And maybe to say where you're taking us in this is to say, mm. if I'm going to be marveling in that, mm. I'm also marveling in like, man, I've got this substance called oil <laughs> and it's this pretty amazing stuff. It makes food amazing. It brings life yeah. to me when I eat it. Yeah, it, yeah. it, it restores could, my skin. It restores my skin. You go from flaky to shiny and smooth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, there's so much life. And and what is oil? It, it's like water. It comes from fruit. <laughs> <laughs> it comes from yeah. the fruit of trees. Yeah, the seed of trees. Yeah, and it's like it's liquid like water. Yeah, but it's infused with so much more life than merely water. Yeah. And so then my imagination is thinking like, okay, what is the life that's mm. infused in this oil? And it just makes me just meditate and think of like, well, what's the life infused in me mm-hmm. that makes me alive? Mm. And those two ideas are now like- mm. f- So good. Connected in my I'm so compelled by what you're saying right now. <laughs> <laughs> Have I convinced you, Tim? <laughs> Have I made the point? <laughs> yeah, that's totally right. So- what water does to the ground, bringing about life, is like what spirit does to the lifeless ground to make it human. <laughs> and so water and spirit, liquid and spirit, become joined here in terms of they both play analogous roles in bringing about life to different types of creatures. So going from here, there's two paths you can track down that I think help us understand anointing oil. One is that throughout the rest of the story of the Bible, when God wants to talk about a new era or a new time, when he will bring about the restoration of creation and bring new life to the land, what you often get are images of Yahweh providing water in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And what you'll start to see, especially in the prophets, is they talk about a new era of God's spirit coming. And they always describe the spirit as a liquid. Mm. So, for example, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 2. This is what the Lord says, the one who made you and formed you. Mm. This is God speaking to exiled Israel through the prophet. So this is what God says, who made you and formed you. It's the same word as Genesis 2. Okay. Formed you from the womb, who will help you. Don't be afraid, Jacob, my servant, for I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. You're like, oh yeah. Genesis 2. Yeah. Yahweh does that kind of thing. <laughs> That's how like this all started. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> That's how humans were formed. So I pour out water on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your seed, your offspring, and pour out my blessing on your descendants. Mm. They will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. Yeah. Okay. It's cool. Like this idea of blessing now being thrown in the mix Mm -hmm. is something we haven't really Mm. talk specifically about, which is the life of the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. It's a life of abundance. That's right, yes. And where life can multiply. Yeah. And so oil, as a symbol, makes sense to represent mm-hmm. abundance. Abundance. It's compressed life. Yes, yeah, exactly yeah. right. And here, now notice oil isn't mentioned here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just 
liquid. Uh, so I'll pour out water on the desert ground. I'll yeah. pour out my spirit on your descendants. The mm -hmm. assumption is you all and your descendants are like a dry, lifeless ground. Mm. He says to the people in exiled in Babylon. Mm -hmm. But there's an era coming, just like when God looked upon that barren desert wasteland in the beginning of the Eden story, when he will bring about a new creation and a new humanity. And it will begin with the pouring of water and the pouring out of the Spirit. And those are joined images. So at a basic point you're saying, isn't it cool to see how receiving God's Spirit is turned into a liquid metaphor? Yeah. There's a connection. Yeah. Between what's going on with the living water, but God's Spirit coming down and with the living water mm -hmm. creating living nefesh. Yeah. And this idea of now we can think of God's Spirit like a liquid. That's right. Yeah. Can I pause and ask, there's kind of fundamentally different types of getting God's Spirit, it feels like we're talking about, because mm. God breathing in the nostrils and every creature being full of the breath of God mm -hmm. feels like this kind of universal, like we all are animated by yeah, yeah. God. In him, we move and, and live. That's the Garden happen. of Eden sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also the sense now, mm -hmm. right? Y yeah. The Bill well, that's what I mean. outside of the garden would say, I still am animated by God's Ruach. Yes. And when he takes it, my life is gone. Yeah. I go down to the yep. ground. And that is how God's spirit is talked about all over the Hebrew Bible. In Job, Ecclesiastes, and the Psalms, God's breath is in my nostrils, Job says. There's another way the spirit is talked about, like when it descends on David. Mm -hmm. When he's anointed. Yes, exactly. Right? <laughs> Which when is like, he's anointed. Because he David's alive, he has the spirit of God in his nostrils. Yeah. But then the spirit of God comes down again. We're talking about spirit descending on you mm -hmm. in two different ways now. Yeah, it's like there is life 1.0, mm. which is just... Pretty great. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty it's, it's amazing. amazing. Yeah, totally. But having God's breath in you, there is an, another level, life 2.0, um, that is described by Isaiah. He's talking to a group of people who have the breath of God in their nostrils in Isaiah 44. Right. They're alive, but they're also dead, as it were, because mm. they're cut off from the land of promise and blessing. They're, they believe they're cut off from God's presence because they violated the covenant and they're living in the land of dust and death. So they're alive but dead. Mm. In other words, uh, you can be alive in one sense, but if you're outside of Eden, you're... Yeah, on the day you eat of this fruit, you will die. You will die. And then the day they eat of the forbidden fruit, they... They're still alive. They are exiled. But they're exiled. They're alive, but in the land of dust and death. And so if God is going to restore humanity to the abundant life of Eden mm -hmm. and to eternal life, that becomes what this language of a new pouring of water and a new pouring of spirit to be connected to the life of heaven. And so here, Isaiah is hoping that Israel will once again be recreated, as it were, into a new humanity through water and spirit. And that's what he's hoping for here. So that's for a whole group of people. Mm -hmm. But then you start to see that all of these anointed figures, like an Aaron, or like that spot that Jacob anointed, or like King David. King David is the first person who had said when he got the oil poured on his head, the spirit of the Lord came on him, water and spirit. Now, he's already alive. Mm. He's already got the breath of God in his nostrils. Yeah. So all of a sudden, there's moments when through liquid and spirit, a person, a place is marked as a special portal between heaven and earth to bring about that reunion of heaven and earth mm. in some way. And I think that's where all of a sudden all these themes come crashing together <laughs> of the liquid life and the spirit are joined images. Mm. And that's what anointing means in the Bible, which in my mind, it's just a bundle of associated images now. Right. So when you were explaining it earlier, it, it, it actually <laughs> made more sense to me than it made in my head. <laughs> oh, cool. 
Great. So what's significant, I guess you can go from here, is a question that you've asked. Well, first of all, are the pieces, does this tie together into a coherent idea? Liquid and spirit in the Garden of Eden story are how God brings about life. But and what is a way to represent that liquid and spirit together? Yeah, it's oil. Oil is fragrant, water, fragrant, oil. but it's infused with more life than just merely being water. Compressed life. Compressed life. So it represents the idea of God's spirit yeah. infused in water. Yeah. And so when we anoint someone with oil, it's a symbol saying we want God's divine breath in a new way. And it's needed particularly for people who are going to stand in the gap. Yeah. Be the bridge between heaven and earth. They need that. Yeah. And so, but then we are looking at Isaiah 44, and there's this image of God's spirit being poured on in a new way mm -hmm. to all of the people. Yeah. Not just the anointed one, but yeah. all of the seed. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, when Joel, the prophet Joel picks up this promise famously in Joel chapter 2. He talks about a future day when, chapter 2 verse 28, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity mm. and all your sons and daughters will prophesy. Mm -hmm. They'll become bridges for God's heavenly word to be spoken here on earth. And your old men will dream dreams like Jacob and mm. see visions. Mm. And dreams and visions are about being on earth Mm, but be connected to the divine. Yeah, your imagination becomes mm. open to the life and love and the message of heaven. Mm. And even on male and female slaves, I'll pour out my spirit. So the whole human family yeah. is on the docket for getting life 2.0 that's described as liquid life. And by life 2.0, you just mean life restored in yeah. a way because... Yeah. reunified with heaven. Because what happened is is we had life, mm -hmm. outside the garden is death, but... We still have the breath of God in our but nostrils. We still, but we still have some life. <laughs> yeah, that's so right. So how do we get back to full life? Yeah. It's almost like we went from 1.0 mm. to like a beta version. Oh, that's true. Actually, that's a better way. And we need to get back <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to yeah. 1.0. Yeah, sure. Since we're using yeah. programming yeah, language metaphor. Right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is why... The images of the anointing oil as a liquid that's connected with the coming of God's spirit on people and places that are portals between heaven and earth. This is all one united set of ideas. Mm. So with all those things tied together, hopefully, in our minds, mm -hmm. we can go forward and explore a couple other moments in the biblical story where anointing comes up. One will be to talk about the role of the kings, because the anointed kings becomes especially significant with the story of David. And then in the Isaiah scroll, we just looked at one, but the idea of an anointed one and an anointed people plays a huge role in the future pointing hope of the storyline of the Bible. And then all that gets drawn upon by Jesus and the apostles as we go on from there. But for now, we should just meditate on liquid life and uh, go make some guacamole. <laughs> Alright, we're recording. Okay. Hey everyone. Hi. 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 I got a bunch of kids here. How old are you guys? Eleven. Eleven. And you're all in the same school? Yes. What's the school called? It's Marathon Academy. Academy. Marathon Academy. And do you guys use Bible Project? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Every day. Every day. Every day. <laughs> every single every single day we use the Bible Project. Yes. Really? Do you use it at home? Do you use it in, in class? Both. Whenever I Both. can. Oh, yeah. cool. Maybe one or two of you, what's your favorite video? My favorite is probably the Tree of Life video. Mm. I really like that. I like the Tree of Life video too. Shema. Shema. I like the Agape one. Mm, agape, that's a good one. Well, we're gonna read the outro. So you guys just repeat after me. We believe the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. We believe the Bible is a unified story that leads to Jesus. We're a crowdfunded project by people like me. We're a crowdfunded project like people like me. Find free videos. 
Find free videos. Study notes. Study notes. Podcasts. Podcasts. Classes. Classes. And more. And more. At BibleProject.com. At BibleProject.com. Yeah. All right. Nice job, y'all. Thanks, Brad. No, passion, Faith.